morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm excited to see each and every one of you. Thank you very much. Uh, and welcome once again to our symposium day three, uh, National Museums of Kenya. Thank you very much, Mwihaki, for the great and so very well done introduction. Um, I will not repeat my name because it has been said. I remain Jerry. And today I am joined by not only two, but actually four great uh, people, members of this, uh, uh, this uh, symposium who are doing great work, as you will hear. I'm going to introduce those who are present, and I will also introduce those who are joining us virtually. And I will start with um, Dr. Lydia Muthuma. Dr. Lydia Muthuma is a senior lecturer in the visual arts at the Technical University of Kenya, an alumni of Université Michel de Montaigne, Bordex III, France, Dr. Muduma's research interests focus on the meeting point of culture and the visual arts, especially Eastern Africa's visual articulation and production. From 2020, she has been collaborating with Barnard College, Columbia University Center for the study of social difference, CSSD. Let's welcome Dr. Muthuma. Thank you. And I'm also joined uh, by Mr. Juma Ondeng, who has studied MA Cultural Heritage and International Development at the University of East Anglia, UK, currently working for the National Museums of Kenya as Keeper Antiquity Sites and Monuments, Western Region. He is also one of the founder members of the International Inventory Program, an international research and database project that investigates Kenyan objects held in museums and heritage institutions worldwide, which came into being in 2018. Let us applause Juma Ondeng. We will also be joined virtually by Professor George Okello Abungu, an archeologist and emeritus director general of the National Museums of Kenya. He is founding chairman of Africa 2009 and the International Standing Committee on Traffic in Illicit Antiquities, among others. Professor Abungu is a recipient of numerous awards, including IFE Prize in Museology 2007 Congo Brazzaville, Distinction of Pastor de Patrimoine 2009 Republic of Benin, Lifetime Achievement in Defense of Art 2012, Italy and USA, Chevalier de Older the arts. Let us applause Professor George Okello Abungu. <laughs> Lastly but not least, we are joined by Mr. Onyekachi Wambu, a journalist based in the UK. He is the executive director of Ford UK. He is an author and works on restitution of cultural heritage and the involvement of the African diaspora in this subject. Let us applause Mr. Onyekachi Wambu. Thank you very much, members. Uh, we are joined by Onyekachi Wambu from the UK, and we'll be hearing him on Zoom. Let's kindly play the clip. My name is Onyekachi Wambu. I'm the executive director of the African Foundation for Development. Um, it's, Afford is a charity that has been around, um, uh, formed in 1994 to enhance and expand the contributions that Africans in the diaspora make to Africa's development. Um, we're currently seeing, we see those contributions as fivefold, um, the financial, um, intellectual uh, and knowledge uh, and social uh, capital that the diaspora um, deploy, as, as well as the political capital that the diaspora deploy, and then finally the cultural capital. Um, in that cultural space, we have a program called Return of the Icons, where we're trying to um, look at the issues surrounding restitution and make uh, the case for uh, African looted artifacts and human re remains to be returned to the continent. Yeah, and why are they important to them? I mean, the, there are people who say, well, I mean, these things happened a long time ago. Um, we don't need to revisit that. I mean, we can kind of adapt to the status quo and uh, make the best of it. Well, I think the question is, if, if these things don't matter, why are 
have the British and the Europeans and other Europeans hung on to them for so long. I mean, uh, of course they matter. Um, um, the British, um, you know, in the museums, the argument is made that, you know, Britain um, is um, displaying the world to itself. Um, Africa needs to have uh, its sense of itself as well in, uh, and to display its own treasures in its own um, spaces. And now there's a big debate about whether the current um, Western idea of a museum is the best way to display these items if they were returned. And, and that's a conversation we can have amongst ourselves. Many of these items were functional, they were uh, ritual objects. Uh, so is a museum the best place to display them, display them anyway? So that's when they're returned. Um, so that's a big conversation we can have. But there's no doubt about the importance of, of these cultural it items. The, an example of our, our genius, if you look at the treasures from um, the, ben, the Benin bronzes, from the Ashanti gold pieces, um, the Egyptian, uh, the Pharaonic pieces, um, um, the Ethiopian pieces from the Magdala, you know, I mean, these are world um, defining aesthetic and uh, artistic triumphs and um, Africa needs to have that as well to reconnect to its past and to begin to understand how um, young young Africans can be inspired by this, can react to it, but can see it as part of how they begin as the AU wants by 2063 to recreate an African Renaissance. You know, if you if you don't have the naissance, how can you have a Renaissance? And, and the naissance are in these pieces. Absolutely. Um, so let's move on to um, an area of immense interest to me because I know you've been working in this area, uh, which is really the whole question of the responsibility of institutions in the global north. Um, and, you know, in terms of policy, in terms of legislation, as well as other, you know, um, advocacy work that can be done in the global north. How do you, you know, how would you um, say uh, is the responsibility of institutions in the in, in Europe and the United States, uh, researchers as well as the media, to facilitate restitution um, and and also to um, amplify, you know, the voices of of those of us who are based on the continent. The first thing we think that needs to happen and resources need to be provided for this is that um, we need to know what is there and we need to know who um, the material belongs to, who the artifacts belong to, who the human remains belong to. So there's a, a, a process of auditing and there's a process of cataloging that needs to be done first. And whether the museums are bound by the 63 Act in the UK or they're not, um, that process need, needs to happen so that we know what's in there. And the museums will tell you that what's on display is a fraction of the collections that they have. And there's a lot of stuff in basements and in boxes that we simply don't know, and they don't know uh, what they are. And that work needs to be done. And I hope we have all listened and heard, and I think I want to just point out on one thing that I heard from uh, Onyekachi, that Africa needs to be given a sense of itself. It needs to have a sense of itself. And that is, I think, why we are having this conversation. And I think I would like to start off by, you know, asking uh, uh, my, my fellow uh, uh, here in front and, and ask maybe Juma, You've heard about what uh, Onyekachi Wambu has talked about and, and basically issues of how culture can be used in development and how that happens and how that works when we are talking about materials that are elsewhere, materials that we cannot relate to, materials that some of us cannot even like identify with because they are so removed from us. We've had conversations in the last two days talking about issues of erasure erasure of complete communities, erasure of complete, uh, you know, architecture and art. 
maybe as we go to that, can you maybe tell me what you think or what you feel that Africa or Kenya particularly is, is part of this conversation? Do you think restitution is something that we need to do? Do we need it? Maybe you can start off, Juma. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Njeri. And uh, I want to thank the organizers of this, uh, professor, particularly Professor Kimani and the British Council. It's interesting that we are discussing restitution in a symposium organized by the British Council at a time when we have been trying to get uh, databases uh, from the British Museum uh, and there are a lot of bottlenecks, legal bottlenecks placed along that path. Uh, restitution uh, for me, uh, I would say it's a human rights issue. Now, and why do I say this? Uh, we have to look at how these objects left the continent. Uh, number one, uh, for the British, uh, during the British Empire uh, adventure in Kenya, we had a lot of punitive military expeditions. And uh, I'll give example, uh, there were communities in Chitambe and Lumboka in Bungoma who were completely decimated and in the process, their objects, uh, the, what Onyekachi has said that these were daily use objects. Yeah, when those communities, the, the fortress in uh, Chitambe and Lumboka were attacked, what happened? Everything was cutted away. Uh, they then ended up, as we speak, in Pitt Rivers Museum in the UK. Uh, that community need to have justice by having their objects back. Now, uh, the second incidence, uh, ways through which these objects left in Kenya, you'll talk about legal instruments that were used. So we have uh, uh, the Witchcraft Act, for example, of 1925, which proscribed any traditional uh, medicinal practices, which were all lumped under the basket of witchcraft. Now, the district commissioners who are given immense powers to confiscate all the witchcraft paraphernalia and destroy them. The fact of the matter is they were never destroyed. So they all ended up in museums in the UK and elsewhere. Uh, number three, we had religious conversion. Because when people attack you, they don't just attack you physically. They also attack your culture, the fundamental of your existence and identity. So those who are being evangelized and Christianized decided that they should have a new identity and gave, back, gave out things. Missionaries took these things out of, out of the country. And of course, there have been other incidents of outright plunder and theft. So restitution for me is very important because it's about human rights violation in the past. And the only thing we can do right, especially from Europe and North America that keep on lecturing Africa about fundamentals of human rights and, uh, and justice, is for them also to reciprocate by restricting these objects. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Juma. It's very interesting that yeah, uh, your observations are very key. But probably we can shift and, and talk with Dr. Muthuma. I, I know that you've been playing a very key role in issues of visual art, and especially information of our young people at the university and at, at, the, at the college level. But then I also know, or I have learned that you are also are playing a role in what you're calling the National Memory of the World. And uh, probably you can tell us a little bit about that as, as, as we also kind of also connect that, that. What does it mean? And, and for you, do you think that has a connection to restitution? Thank you very much, uh, everybody who's here and the ones who are joining us online. Um, memory of the World. This is a body that was started by UNESCO, and the idea is to put together the documentary heritage of the world. It happened after the scuttling of the museum in Timbuktu. After the war, people felt, oh, we, we have lost something that we cannot replace. It is important because what our forefathers did, whether they are our direct ancestors or not, if they produced iconic works of um, aesthetics or even simple functional objects, I think it's good to honor them. Um, what is, can be a little tricky is that whoever formulates the legal approach, the policy approach to any worldwide uh, organization 
needs to take in the views of every participant. Uh, what do I mean by all these large, huge words? Kenya is a member state of UNESCO. Now, if we are collecting documentary heritage, uh, Kenya, I would say, is largely an oral-based culture. And because of that, Kenya has not yet registered any item in the memory of the world. The closest country to us that has done so is Tanzania, precisely because of Zanzibar. And what uh, they have registered are some, um, the original manuscript of a Tarabu music. And uh, you'll agree with me, it is something iconic. And of course, we appreciate that at the coast, we are dealing with a civilization that is 800 years old, and there was writing done. In fact, the writing originally was in Arabic. Later on, it was uh, written in Roman script. So the, whatever has been registered in the memory of the world is actually in Roman script. So I wouldn't even call it original, but that's me. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now, Kenya is disadvantaged because we rely on oral traditions and an oral way of passing on information. Yesterday, Dr. Nyairo talked about capturing our culture on soundscapes, on video, on film. Where is that material? Because clearly, that is something we would like to put on the re register of the world. And because of that disadvantage, the African members of UNESCO are actually coming together to put up a register of Africa, and the African memory of the world. I think it is a good way to go, not because we have a quarrel with the global one, but because we will make um, a contribution that is relevant to the world and also to ourselves. Because if culture is to be evaluated, assessed, appreciated, always from the external, it loses its soul. You know, this cultural heritage we are talking about, the restitution, the bringing back, after bringing back, what happens? Have we asked ourselves that question? Decolonization is a good way to go, but after decolonizing, gap, no, silence. I, I don't know, maybe you've thought it out, but uh, I haven't heard much about that. The real, the, the fact of the matter is, culture is about our intimate selves, who we are today, and of course we are who we are today because of the people who come before us. So whatever our ancestors did, whether it's in Chitambwe or uh, it's in the Mau Mau Caves, yesterday somebody talked about the Mau Mau Caves, it doesn't matter whether we wrote it down or did not, we had a way of passing it on. Can we look for ways of registering that in our national memory of the world and in the Africa memory of the world and later on, if needs be, in the global memory of the world? So in a nutshell, that is what memory of the world stands for. And uh, the body, the commission, the committee was put together. Draw, members were drawn from the National Archives, the National Library, uh, the Museums of Kenya, um, Kenya Broadcasting Corporation, what was VOK, a few universities that have arts um, faculties. Um, yeah, but I thought that it would be a good idea to let you know, because I think you are key players, the people who are taking part here. You are part and parcel of the culture of Kenya, what we have inherited and what we are manufacturing or living today. Wow, thank you very much, Dr. Muthuma. It's very interesting. I thought it's good to bring in those two issues that are currently what is happening. And that actually also brings me to my next question, and this could go to Juma. When we were listening to Wambu, he said, uh, he said 
that they, and there was a, a, an indication that the holding institutions in the global north have a responsibility. And I'm also, I'm also aware that Juma and uh, the museum has been doing work on the provenance research on restitution under uh, the international inventory program. I would like you to connect those two and say, like, see, look at it and, 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 and say, like, probably tell the audience, what do you feel that the, the, the holding institutions are taking up their responsibility? What is your experience? Is there a connection between what Dr. Muthuma is talking about uh, in terms of documentary heritage, what is oral, even if it's not written, is it connecting to whatever it is that you have found? Because he has come out very clear and say that even before we start thinking about what we need to bring, we need to understand what we have. So is there, has there been a connection or is there, is there a disconnect between what you may have found probably in the IIP, you can tell us a little bit about that, and whether it's a disconnect between what you have done, how there is a connection between what is out there and what is existing in the oral traditions of the people today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the key questions that I would like to address is the issue of uh, databases. Uh, I know because we have an oral tradition, uh, you don't keep a database in your, in your mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, when you engage with communities, the things that were lost uh, there's a bit of erasure because the current generation do not understand what left. Now, this is now a responsibility on the withholding in institutions to declare, to be more uh, open about what they have. Uh, International Inventories Program, which uh, National Museums of Kenya has partnered with other organizations, the Nest Collective, uh, the Shift Collective, uh, funded by Gothe Institute, and have two par other partners, uh, Rautenstrauch Jost Museum in Germany and uh, Welter Kulten, WKM Museum in Frankfurt. Uh, what we tried for the, since 2018 is to develop a comprehensive database of Kenyan objects that left the country from pre-independence period. So uh, the work has been quite comprehensive. Now, we have been writing those letters to these institutions. I think we wrote over 100 letters in the course of about three years. Uh, the response has not been, it has been a mixed bag of results. Uh, so far, we have about 34 uh, museums responding with their databases, and that has a number of about 32,000, slightly over 32,000 objects in that database. Now, initially, when we began the IIP process, we thought the focus would only be on, on cultural, on, on material heritage objects as a main focus. Uh, but then we realized that as we talked with communities, people came up with uh, lost relatives. So human remains became now part of what we have to, to difficult conversation we have to have with these museums. And we realized that in some museums, they don't declare human remains. So they'll tell you, okay, uh, this is uh, a side chart. Uh, we don't want it on record that we have human remains from Kenya, but we are not going to declare it openly, so we need other avenues of engaging with this. Now, so even though they have these things, they are not also transparent about it. There's opaqueness in terms of the information they are giving. So they select what they think is right for them to give, and then they hold back on some information that they feel uh, are sensitive. Uh, and this then calls upon us uh, and our institutions, our, our government, to be more assertive in terms of how this process is carried forward. I, I know Professor Kimani has been very passionate about this, and always I wish he was at the center of government driving this process forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question, mm -hmm. but there is opaqueness from the global north in terms of the information uh, they are giving to us in Africa. So in short, what you're telling us that the responsibility, which is very well known, even just being open about what we are holding is not happening now. Yeah. So we are simply saying that we are calling on those institutions and all who can listen and hear and talk to them that we need that responsibility of saying, hey, this is what we have. Mm -hmm. That is very, very interesting. Yeah, and I will add something. Uh, in as much as Africa is talking about restitution, I'll be very honest about this now. I was in Germany last year on a different mission, and I talked with a number of museum directors, and the question I asked them, how many restitution requests do you get from Africa? None of African museums 
had presented requests directly to museums in Germany, for example, because those directors were mostly from Germany. And even Nigeria, which has been very vocal in terms of demanding for things, only presented a petition to the British Museum last year in October. So that means, brings the question whether we are really serious about restitution. Uh, because if we are, uh, there should be more action on the ground. And the action should be uh, government at the center of this, governments across Africa at the center of this. Thank you very much. It's very interesting because uh, it means that we are already saying that the role that is being played by Toweza Communication and by Professor Kimani here present, we want to push you to straight to government so that you can push for this. It's very interesting because that tells you that the Kenyans have the issues of restitution at heart and they want to see action at the center of it where it's required. So this is very interesting. So it is very good because you've told us about the work you've been doing and you have tried to do a connection. But probably as we come slightly towards the end, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Muthuma to tell us what the role of academia is in the issues, two issues that you've talked about. The documentation of memories of Kenya and also restitution and the research that has been happening. What is the role of academia in this discourse? That's a tough order, but let me try. Um, everybody in society has a role to play. And academics, sometimes we want them to be like a camera. Whatever is happening, you want to jot it down and write it as you know, in real time, as they say. That is the role of journalism, not academia. <laughs> because um, a scholar needs to wait for the images to pass before them. And then those images or that information or that material, whatever it is, just the living of life, let it sink into one's soul let it settle there, let that person think it through um, so that you can arrange it into um, some cohesion, some coherence, something that will make sense because we have thought about it, uh, critiqued it, rearranged it, measured it against the public. Ordinarily, this happens I know there's an author I like very much who says that we have to wait for the fresh images to settle and coalesce into some revitalizing imagination. They are all very big, huge words. Anyhow, uh, your academic needs to take a bit of time, look at life, think about it, and then present it to us. Usually, there's a mechanism to check the academic. You know, the famous um, peer review, the, um, the, lead, the lead supervisor, etc. We have been doing this quite well, I'd say, in the universities, but there's the fear sometimes of not deciding when something is good enough. We want to look at the UK, the US, they want to look at well-established universities. If you go into an interview, the first question is, have you published in peer-reviewed journals? And the peer-reviewed journals, that's a very, um, it's just a way of asking you, have you been published by somebody in the States or somebody in the UK? Mm -hmm. Why do I need to be published in Europe in order to talk to you about yourselves and about myself? Uh, so probably academia there the academy in Kenya, we need to revise our situation and our measuring eyes, our lenses, because if I publish with Toweza Communication, I think I should get, it should have more merit than publishing with Harvard University Press. I don't know if, they, if there's something like that, mm -hmm. because I am talking about my community and I'm talking to my community so they will understand me much more. The second point is that whether we like it or not, 
whatever scholarship there is about the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, it will not come from the Africans. A, few, a bit of it may. Uh, here I can cite Mze Kenyatta. He wrote a very interesting dissertation facing Mount Kenya. We all look at it, we read it. The scholars of his time, or the, lit the literati of his time, will be people like Elspeth Huxley. So whether I like it or not, as an academic, if I'm looking at the Kenya of 1930s, 40s, I will have to rely on um, the perspective of Western scholars. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. However, my fellow academics, the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, we lived it. Mm -hmm. We can write about it. I don't think there's too much written about it. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to wake up and decide that critiquing, reviewing, suggesting, looking back on what was done in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, that responsibility lies squarely on the academy of today. Mm -hmm. And there are enough members, even in this institution, to come up with a journal like yesterday and to say, this is what I think. You as my peer, what do you think? We should get that, we should get that ball rolling long ago. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's a problem of funding, who puts money into research, how is it directed, that's a bigger, I, I'm not qualified to answer that, but it's something we need to look into. Maybe the institutions, the academic institutions or government, they need to pitch in and say, fine, what you need is publication. You want that academic discourse to keep going, to be alive, this is what I can do for you. Because honestly, I felt very cheated that I had to go all the way to Bordeaux, France, in order to study Nairobi. It just doesn't make sense. Nairobi, that's where I was born, that's where I live. Surely I should be able to study Nairobi from Nairobi. And my critics will come from Nairobi. People in Bordeaux, France, in fact, I might cheat them a bit if I want to. I mean, really, because uh, how many of them will know that the statue of Mze Jomo Kenyatta that is in front of the KICC, he's dressed in academic regalia. He's wearing robes of the vice chancellor of University of Nairobi because when that statue was cast, he happened to be the vice chancellor of University of Nairobi. People in Bogdo don't know and probably don't care because really it doesn't mean that much to them. And that answers your question. The people who are holding data from Africa, from Kenya, you know, in a sense, it loses meaning mm -hmm. because it lacks that vital connection. You know, culture is not just something data you have on a shelf in a database or the skin that was worn, I don't know by who. Mm -hmm. If it is not connected to the people who give it life, then it ceases to be heritage. Heritage it needs to be inherited by somebody, somebody who understands it, somebody who will um, live with it, translate it into something meaningful. Um, the clip we watch from Wambu, his name is? Yes, he's talking about ritual objects. If you're not going to live that ritual, if that ritual doesn't mean anything to you, it can be in the best museum in Germany, but it has been fossilized. Mm. Mm. It is dead. Mm. And to say that, oh, you know, the Museum Act, the legal, I don't know what, the law does not come before people. Mm. We need to delink the two. Mm. We are the same ones. To go back and redraft that law, mm. give the heritage to the people that it belongs to, mm. you have said that few museums have asked for repatriation. Probably it's because they don't know where their information is being held. So somebody somewhere, I don't know whether that is the work of academia or the work of lawyers, I'm not sure who it is, but somebody somewhere needs to identify that material. I think our Global North partners should also declare without waiting to be asked. Just let it be known. And then from there we can move on. Because for me, this whole debate 
is actually about humanizing everybody. We cannot imagine that he is more human than I am or I am more human than he is. Because if the playing field is not level, we, we can't even hold a conversation. Heritage is for all of humanity, and humanity has a basic equality that cannot be negotiated. If it is important to me and to my family, because I'm a human being, whatever is important to him and his community is his, and if I am holding it, it is only proper that I give it over. Mm. For the simple reason that he's as human as I am. So academia has a job of articulating these issues, locating that information, talking about it, critiquing it. Our voices will be limited when we come to events and activities of the 1930s, mm. but they are no less valid. Mm. The events of 1970s, 80s, and 90s, I think we are failing ourselves. Mm. We need to wake up and do something about it. The other role that academia can play is that we have been very active in politics. Kenya is a politically charged nation. The political debate is vibrant, has always been. The cultural debate, the academic debate, the scholars, where is our voice? I don't hear it as much. And there, it would be remiss to blame our global partners. We also have a role to play. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have responded to you, your... You really have done it. And it's very interesting because you, you have brought in very in, you know, important issues, talking about the role of academia as the role, making sure you articulate, locate, you know, identify, articulate, locate, and, and articulate, not only keep quiet. And I think that also talks about the voice that academia must have in issues that are happening in this country or in, in Africa in general. And that connects very well with what uh, my, 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 my colleague has talked about, issues of uh, the fact that leadership could be wanting. But maybe we can uh, digress a bit and, 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 and kind of also connect the two and talk about what to me seems like a hangover of a kind, because that, that is what you've been talking about, that for me to publish, I have to measure it against something. It could have something to do with the, the kind of uh, a, you know, a, a curriculum we could be following, or what we have borrowed, or what we have, you, we have always acquired. And the hangover also comes in terms of, if I brought an object to Bungoma, for instance, you talked about a, a, whole, a whole community that was you know, finished and, and, the, and the rest. As do you think that today, the people of Bungoma or the people who are currently living there could identify with the object or would they want to distance themselves from it? And that this one, I want to leave it open because how far have we dealt with the issues of hangover that we carry along from where we have come and how it's affecting how we are moving forward? Mm. Oh. <laughs> uh, people, I, I don't think if, uh, that's not a question that we should even be asking whether people can relate with it. Uh, let the objects come first. That's a debate for the community. Mm -hmm. If they decide, because as uh, Onyekachi said, uh, that those, some of those objects were not meant for museums. So we are putting them in the wrong context. Mm -hmm. uh, if I recall correctly in engagement with community members, mm -hmm. uh, one of the elders told us that objects exist in two forms. Mm -hmm. There's the body and the soul. Mm -hmm. So what the withholding organizations have at the moment, they have the bodies of these objects. Mm -hmm. But the souls remained here. So contextually, contextually, they are irrelevant in those spaces. Mm -hmm. So even if you look at those displays, what do they display African objects? It's about, oh, this figurine from this particular community, mm -hmm. this the size, it's mm -hmm. from Kenya, this community, the year. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what is relevant to their community. But here, when we display an object, the cultural significance of that object plays a key role in how we understand the objects. Uh, and so let the objects come first. Mm -hmm. Now, communities are well aware of what they want to do. At times, those objects are just sources of pride. They, that, that's what people, the reason why they want them. They identify with them, mm -hmm. and they are a source of pride, uh, uh, past cultural creativity. Mm -hmm. And they are going to inspire new inventions, as we, uh, uh, from yesterday's speakers, mm -hmm. that those forms are important for us because they are also going to inform the kind of creativity we are going to have going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Very, very interesting. Do you want like to do you like, would you like to say something? Yes, sure. I would like to add on to his answer with a very personal story. In 2018, I went to Bristol in the UK and um, I visited a museum there. The city of Bristol has inherited what was the Commonwealth Museum and you will not believe it. I was looking through photographs and I came across a photograph that had a caption you know, my surname, Muthuma, is not a very common name. Mm. That's a name that I saw there. So, of course, I started reading. And this is only 1950s, 1960s. It was a story about the Mau Mau. And a relative of mine, his photograph is in Bristol, in a museum that belonged to the Commonwealth. I felt exposed. Mm. I felt undressed. I felt... Uh, uh, what words can I use? I mean, how can there. they keep the photograph of my relative without my knowledge, without... In fact, I did not continue with the workshop that day. I told them, you know, I'm feeling ill. I need to go back to the hotel. And I was actually ill. So when we are debating restitution, how can they have a part of me there, because my relative is part of me, and then ask, should they bring it back? Do I know anything about it? What do I feel about it? That, that you cannot ask those questions. Mm -hmm. Just bring it back, and afterwards, we can talk about it. Because you have dismembered me. Mm -hmm. you, you have scattered me all over Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, then, not also Southern mm -hmm. Europe. You've taken me to the global north. They dished me out. I, I would rather be where I choose to be. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is very, very, very touching. The injustices, you can see it on Dr. Mothuma's face. You know, seeing a, a, a name of, of a relative in a place that they cannot identify with. It's really, really, you know, it's, you, it, you feel laid bare, li, you know, literally. But probably we can just like in, get into that a little bit more. And this I want to direct it to uh, Juma because uh, your experience in working with communities and uh, collecting, uh, you know, uh, voices from communities and understanding what they would want or what they think about or they feel about the objects or the whatever, uh, at times human remains uh, is very, very painful because we even have human remains in those museums and what they feel about them. Do they or do you think, first as a, as a keeper of the, of, of, of the heritage in Kenya, in Western Kenya, and uh, also as a researcher, do you feel that bringing the objects back and bringing them back into a museum like the National Museums of Kenya is what we are looking at here. Maybe you can enlighten, enlighten us on that a little bit. Uh, bringing them back to national institutions will be perpetuating injustice. Mm -hmm. uh, museums, as I know, are not makers of heritage, so we can't live under illusion uh, that we know what we need to do with those objects. Mm -hmm. uh, in engagement with community members, which was part of the international inventories programs, uh, the community voices were loud and clear. Uh, let objects go back to communities of origin. Mm -hmm. Now, then they sort things from there onwards. Uh, if we bring them and then stock them again in national museums, and our, uh, it, it's sad for me because uh, I think we can't replace injustice with another injustice. So even though I work for the National Museums of Kenya, I will never support uh, any attempt, for example, to bring objects and then hold them again in another prison called National Museums of Kenya. Mm -hmm. What we need and the community voices are very clear. Communities are, it was interesting when we went to, with you to Dingira, mm -hmm. and they are very active cultural group. Mm -hmm. They know what they can do with the objects when they go back. Mm -hmm. They have been trying to trace some of those objects. When you look at the Ndome, for example, mm -hmm. They couldn't find it. They went all ar around all the Kikuyu uh, counties, mm. but they could only get one piece, mm. which is quite old. Mm. So when the, you take the domains back to them, they know what they can do with it. Mm. And so question of them going back to National Museum for me is out. We don't even have enough storage to do that. It's interesting, but I want to follow that a little bit more and probe you a little bit more. When you say that objects should go back to the community, are they prepared? Are they ready? No, do they, they have the capacity? When those objects were made, uh, the makers never intended them to be sanitized. So uh, the old things, things with the sanitizing, if it's a pot, it's a utilitarian object. 
if it's a ritual thing, it was made for that particular ritual. When the ritual ends, communities know what to do with it. If it comes and it was something that was an end result of a ritual, and the community rules dictate we need to destroy it, then let us destroy it. Because that's what the community is all about. Mm. They know what they want to do with this. They don't need to have a storage like this. Mm. They don't need to have pads under pots. They know how they keep their pots there. And so uh, what we need, and I think this is something that we, we need to talk about, uh, that I ask this question whether we are really ready for restitution. Uh, there are fundamental things that we need to do, and they are not being done. Uh, Professor Kimani is a very lone voice in this country, mm -hmm. and I wish the academia, everyone else will be joining in singing this chorus. We need policy framework that can make us engage with the museums in Global North, because for them, uh, they hide behind laws, they hide behind policies, mm -hmm. they hide behind everything that they have created, mm -hmm. which suits them. But if we have a robust system, starting with our own internal policies, mm -hmm. so that as, a, as Kenya, as Africa, we have policies that then guides how we engage with them. Uh, all these community demands should be bilateral engagement between our African governments and European. As they negotiate for uh, gold, silver, everything that comes from this continent, there should also be a clause that say, okay, in the process of this, we'll also want a return of things. Yeah, so we need to be serious about this by working on our policy and legislative legislative framework mm -hmm. that will make these negoti negotiations possible mm -hmm. yeah, that's, is there anything else you think that this country need, needs to do as we move forward and get ready for restitution Dr. okay uh, may i first put a footnote to his sure. answer sure. you asked what are we ready to receive mm -hmm. our artifact mm -hmm. i was very ready to take the photograph of my relative from Bristol Museum. I, I would have it done it bag. immediately, mm -hmm. but there are rules, legalese, very many things. Mm -hmm. And it is very condescending for the holding institution mm -hmm. to ask me mm -hmm. if I am ready to handle my memories, mm -hmm. my he inheritance, my heritage. Mm -hmm. That should not even be put into a question form. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question of what we will do with them, since we are equally human, each community will decide, as he said, you don't need to line the pot. I mean, we just pot shards simply go back to the ground. Mm -hmm. And I think here we can rope in the county governments. We have devolved political, um, this political setup. Maybe we also need to devolve cultural and culture and heritage it's because already, the owners... It's already devolved. It is, uh, thank you very much for that. It's already devolved. Mm -hmm. Then the county government, that is a smaller unit, mm -hmm. they will know what to do with the cultural baggage that comes back. Mm -hmm. After all, it is theirs. Wow, thank you very much. So we are talking about policy framework. We are talking about understanding what is out there. So I would call that simply databases. Like, can, every, can we be able to document as much as we can what is out there? And then, of course, the role of county governments as smaller units. And I have read and I have had the conversation that at times when there is a claim, it's always going back to the community, that some claims have to go to communities because when an object was taken, it was not taken from a country called Kenya. Kenya in itself that time did not exist. So definitely, if we are able to organize ourselves using a legal framework, which is formed by our national government, we will have muscle to be able to ask for what we need. And probably it's a good time right now to listen to Professor Abungu and see what he has to say about this subject. You can play the clip. I am uh, an archaeologist and a Kenyan, uh, and uh, I am uh, Emeritus Director General of the National Museums of Kenya, uh, and I've taught in a number of universities, basically on archaeology and heritage, and I've written quite a bit on the issue of restitution. What do we need to do on the continent itself, in terms of our own as researchers, as academia, as people who are committed to the transformation of Africa 
um, but also, you know, as institutions, as governments, to facilitate this, um, you know, balancing of relations between Africa and the global north, um, as well as facilitating the restitution of what that which belongs to to our people. This, this is a question that demands that we commit ourselves, not only the government, but also the people who form the government, the people who are in the institutions, and to be able to accept, to accept, and I say this because I've also worked in this institution, that we are still lacking in terms of our understanding of exactly sometimes what we want and how we are going to use this. Why do we want this? We want it because there is a reason. First of all, to correct the injustices. Secondly, to bring back and fill those gaps that were created. And thirdly, to utilize them as resources for our development and for the future of our nations. But if we don't have that among our professionals in the museum, we are always busy looking at collections and going on with life as usual, protecting only what we have. We are not going to concentrate and we are not going to develop better arguments to bring these things back. But is it possible that part of the problem uh, of this non-appreciation of our heritage uh, results from um, our educational system um, that does not put culture, uh, you know, and the arts, and really does not seem to value, you know, uh, indigenous knowledge systems um, as part of our economic and as critical to our economic and political transition, as well as uh, social, you know, social development. Is it possible that that culture? Uh, is so much on the periphery within the educational system, within our political work, within uh, our reflection, that somehow when people take up position in government, they still think that culture is not is unimportant. Uh, Professor, you know, that is a big question. And I know we don't have time for that. But let me take the Africa uh, Agenda 2063. It puts culture at the top there. If you take the 2020, 2021, you know, uh, theme for African Union, you know, levers for development, arts, culture, and heritage. But how much is this theory rather than practice? How many countries put even 2% of their, uh, their budget to culture? None. Culture and the Ministry of Culture is the least, the, the least, you know, uh, funded. So we talk big on this side for reasons of politics, and we do nothing in education. If you look at the curriculum, what is there that would actually inspire the youth to be able to take that line and proceed on with that and to actually appreciate that? So yes, our education system still is not liberated from the thinking of the past which made us believe that what we have in terms of culture was bad because it was you know we were brought missionaries brought us christianity they called they told us that we had to ban all these things while they were busy carrying these things to their museums in europe and that everything was bad and for us that mindset has stayed there even to the government systems where when they are debating budgets culture comes last when when cabinet is being announced the last cabinet that position that is announced is that Ministry of Culture and Heritage. So unless we move away from that and ground our development in our culture, we are going to continue to be slaves. We are going to continue to be people who would be wanting. But really, we have to appreciate that the basis and the foundation of any development, any growth of a nation lays in its culture, in the way it understands itself and carries itself. And until we do that, we are not going to be people of any, any spice. So I, mm, I think that we, we definitely need to be able to, 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 to really rethink the way we want to move on. I think quite insightful and it's a good time actually to move it back to uh, the audience and the plenary. 
as we have heard, that we also know and are aware, and we've been talking since uh, uh, one day before, that was on, on Tuesday, on, on, on yesterday, and talking about culture and the way it's even recognized in our constitution as the foundation of a nation. And of course now, Professor has reminded us that it is also recognized in Agenda 2063, and also in the EU. But then we are asking ourselves, what are we not doing right? Probably it's a good time to open this to them. Yeah? Kindly, there is a mic roaming. I see a hand on that corner. I see, wow, I see five hands. And I think we can take those right now, two at the back and three in the middle here. And then we will have responses. Thank you. My name is Deborah Wanjuko, and um, I'm a lawyer with a passion for traditional knowledge and culture and IP. And my question comes to, or is pointed at the point, uh, what, when you are talking about uh, repatriation and, um, or rather restitution of cultural objects and them going to communities through county governments. Now, there's this act called the Protection of Traditional Knowledge and Cultural Expressions Act, which uh, we usually call the TK Act. Mm. It says that county governments are agents of communities, and there are certain things that they cannot um, work with because they belong to the National Museums of Kenya. So some of those things, despite our vehement um, objection to the existence of NMK or um, some of those objects coming to NMK, um, the law has kind of messed us up in the sense that they will actually come back to the communities and then NMK will be like, oh well, they belong to us, so they will bring, they'll be brought back to NMK. And so my question is, and then currently there are, uh, the act is not fully operational because it doesn't have regulations. And so the regulations are being drafted by the Ministry of Culture. But I did not get to hear of them until at a certain training that I was conducting. <laughs> and um, now my question comes to your involvement in um, the policy and legislative framework. To what extent have county and even the Ministry of Culture um, consulted with you with regard to um, opera operationalization of these acts and, and um, regulations. Wow, thank you. We can take all the questions and then kindly, if you are able to, you can direct it to one of the panelists who are here. So next, thank you very much. Thank you uh, to the panel. My name is Peter Achayo from African Art Matters. Um, so, I'm glad that we are looking back into our history and trying to correct certain injustices that were perpetrated against the African people. But I'm also saddened that we seem to be quite obsessed with our history, particularly in regards to restitution of artifacts and objects, and yet today, the contemporary artist in Nairobi, I mean, is crying and waiting for the Nairobian, for the Kenyan to patronize their art studios. The gallerist is waiting for us for patronage. And in terms of collection and buying of contemporary art, it really, it seems like it's a Western affair. We have a number of very important artists from Kenya, Cyrus Kabiru, his works are at Zait Moka in Cape Town Museum. They're at SMAC as well. Um, Wangeshi Mutu, presently exhibiting at Legion of Honor uh, Museum in, uh, in LA. Uh, Magdalene Odundo, her works, part of the Royal Collection. Several museums have collected her works. Um, Chebet, um, sorry, uh, Mimi Ngok, Chebet Ngok, all of them collected by um, museums in the West. Now, what do we have in terms of collection of contemporary art in our museums? Does our government have an art collection policy? Every major institution, uh, government in the West rather, the State Department, the White House, 
um, 10 Downing Street, they have got very clear art collection policies from contemporary practice. Now, are we waiting for another 30 years so that my daughters right now who are 10 and 13 and are budding artists, um, that in another 30 years, they'll actually be crying for restitution, you know, of works that were sold or released on a willing buyer, willing seller. In an environment where we are so informed, you know, and where we are very current with issues. I mean, that's my dilemma, and I hope uh, that this panel could help us to understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kindly try to make it short. We take the three questions at the back there. There was one, two, there were three hands I saw first. Thank you very much. My name is Michelle Mwangolo of the Oritia Collective, and thank you for a really great panel. Um, my first question just picks up from what Peter said, so I'll make it very brief. To my sister, um, Lydia, what would it take for us to decolonize our minds as a society in terms of seeing only the academy as an intellectual source of production? And here I'm thinking of the ways that from the days when we all sang Ilikuwa October Shinambili Watu Wote, that was history, it was teaching us. All the way to the work that Too Early for Birds has been doing in terms of documenting the histories you're talking about. So what would it take for us to see the arts not just as entertainment, not just as sources of cultural heritage, but actually sources of education, knowledge, and research? And in relation to that, my brother Juma, we've had this conversation before. Every time I listen to the Kenya National Anthem, we know that it is not only the, the lullaby, uh, the, the melody comes from a Pokomo lullaby, but it always reminds me that the beginning of it, whenever we listen to it, the instrumental version, it starts with that do 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 And it reminds us that the British Museum holds the source of that sound in its, it, not even in the galleries, in the storage rooms. And for me, it breaks my heart every time I hear it. So can you speak to us a little bit about the Pokomo Ngaji, which is being demanded for by the people of the Pokomo, and what is being done, and I'm very happy that the British Council is here present, to bring back our sound, our drum that starts our national anthem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, kindly, uh, we take the two questions, kindly make them brief. Uh, my name is Athman Lali Omar. I come from Swahili Resource Center, and I've been working with national museums several years ago when I was old. Uh, my, my question is to George and George. We were given opportunity by the British Council and Taweza to visit some sites in, uh, at the coast. And fortunately, we visited Jumba Lamtwana. We had an excellent tour and a very high discussion level about history, archaeology, biodiversity, and so on and so forth. The sad part of it, after spending almost uh, about one and a half hours in the site, as we are finishing to get out of the site, we came to discover that there is somebody who has developed within the site, and one third of that site showing a wall that is surrounding the historical site of 15th century, it has been taken. What are we talking about decolonization if we still having corruption going into, he, into this uh, uh, you know, heritage management? What can we do, George and George, to reclaim back the land that has been taken and it has all the, the monuments inside it that are really gone forever because uh, maybe the title deed now reads somebody else's name instead of the community. Good morning, my name is Caroline. Um, my concern is on uh, the, the process as we speak about restitution of all these artifacts um, for the younger people maybe my age and below because we will not be young forever um, as these artifacts come do they mean anything to us like dr mutuma said 
if we are disconnected from the culture, then it's, it's dead, it's, it's no longer heritage. And for example, when the Vigangos came back to Mombasa and they were received at For Jesus, the, the people who went to get those, uh, to receive them, they were just old Mijikenda. Uh, men and I remember asking the the artists I work with who are mainly Mijikenda, um, Bona Mjenda Kuchkua Vigango, and they're like, Izoni Nini. So we will be the custodians, uh, we will be the leaders in our community in another 10, 20 years when these artifacts come back and we'll be wondering, uh, What are they? It might just nullify this whole process. So, my concern is are there any efforts being done to ensure that the younger generation is prepared for this? Thanks. Wow, thank you very much. I think I'll direct two questions. One was already sent to uh, Dr. Muthuma about decolonizing our minds. Uh, and then, of course, when you're talking about the intellectual works, and I think it would be good for you to respond to the issue that she has just raised, Karen has just raised about. Uh, whether we have a connection and how we are going to ensure that there is that connection when we receive the artifacts back. And then Juma can prepare to respond to the other three. There's another question from our online audience for, okay. Ju for Juma. Is it possible that smaller cultural centers can be made for these objects within local communities um, th that they belong to in case they are re repatriated? And then we have um, a question from Garnet Olocho Lunya. Um, if we locate Dr. Muduma's family photograph uh, within Dr. Sige's position yesterday on IP, doesn't it mean that this image therefore belongs to the colonizer in the way your participation today will be archived under the British Council? And is it problematic that we are still members of the Commonwealth? Thank you very much. And I think as we go on, there were questions directed to Professor uh, George Abungu. I don't know whether he's online. Okay, thank you. So maybe you can respond to that. You can start with uh, Dr. Muthuma. You can start with the question that has been raised and then answer the other two. Uh, thank you very much, Garnet and Caroline and Shai. I'll try and answer the three of you and everybody else uh, in one sweep. I don't know if I'll do it justice. Um, it is very dangerous to think of culture, to think of heritage as um, material object stored in the past, database collected somewhere in the global north and it's there. No. For me, it is more of a relationship. Because if you tell me that this is my heritage, I need, you know, the, the relationship between me and this object is what gives it life. That photograph that I saw in Bristol, because it's a photograph of my relative, that person is connected to me, that's what makes it, gives it poignancy, it becomes very important to me. Um, somebody referred to culture as a river. I forget who it was now, for, um, forgive me for plagiarizing. Mm. And the river is moving all the time. So we, it is dangerous to think of redirecting the river, damming it up, or stopping the whole process. So whatever was done in the last century, we're not going to look back and undo it, because that's not possible. We were colonized, and we can't wish it away. We inherited many good things from the British, very many. The fact that we are here conversing in English is one of them. We inherited others that we didn't like so much. And there, we need to renegotiate. We need to go back to that relationship that we had and see what needs to change. Uh, somebody called it, I think it was Dr. Nyairo yesterday. We need to pick, select, mm. submerge, mm. remix, um, and keep on going. The river will continue going downstream or wherever it's going. What happens is that we cannot be passive recipients. Mm. Neither can we be, you know, the people who complain forever. Oh, they did, oh, they didn't. Oh, they, they, they. By the way, the people you are talking about are no longer here. They belong to our generation. They were not the colonizers. I mean, in person. They were also born within the post-colonial period, mm. if I can use that word. 
and here I don't refer to the academic theories of postcoloniality. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the historical time. Mm -hmm. So we cannot go back and say, before, this is what our ancestors did with Endome, therefore, we are going to use it that way, and you in the British Museum, why are you holding on to it? Definitely, the Endome will mean more to me than it will mean to the lady and gentleman here simply because my ancestors actually used it. But am I going to use it the way my ancestors did? No. I mean, the year 2023, 20, Dome does not, it does not function today. Actually, I've not set my eyes on one. I don't know it. It's new to me. Mm. I'd have to learn about it. It's just that my perspective will be different from theirs. So here, again, it's a question of justice. We cannot be bashing the colonial masters who have already transferred to the next world, the ones who are here now are our equals. They're also looking at this reality and asking which way do we go, the same way we are asking. So, Mshai, you talked about decolonizing our minds. To begin with, which mind was colonized? The one of my great-grandfather or myself <laughs> now, today. Whatever I am is a result of my education was quite British, I must say. I belong to the system of, what did we call it? The one that had Form 6? Seven, seven something. Six. That one, that's the one I belong to. Mm. It was designed in the UK. Mm. And I have nothing against it. I learned quite a lot. Mm. The content of the curriculum... Um, Mm. could have changed. It was quite international. I thought it was quite international. So if you want to call me colonial from that point of view, I accept, I agree that I'm colonial. What I cannot be blind to is what is happening today. There's a national curriculum review. And today we are asking, do we still need to teach this history? Do we still need this perspective on communities in Kenya or can it change? That is an ongoing job. And at the moment, there's a heated debate about it. I think there's even a court case. Some people are saying, no, 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 you're giving our children too much work or too little. It's relevant, it's not relevant. To me, that's good because they are taking part. They're saying, what do our children need to learn? That in itself is a clear process of decolonizing. Mm -hmm. How it will end up, I cannot tell. But in the area of education, we are definitely doing something to decolonize. So what will it take to decolonize our minds? We have started with the content of our national curriculum. A national curriculum is addressed to 40 million Kenyans. Okay, the ones who are in school at any given time are about 1.5 million in any grade in Kenya. So if we go into the classrooms, and we teach the children that everybody is equally human, be they the descendants of the colonizer or the descendants of the decolonized or the ones colonized, whatever term you want to use. If we approach the debate from that point of view, we are not only name calling, but we are doing something about building the culture, educating the people of today. And let them know, I have inherited a lot from the British. I have also inherited a lot from my local community, and I continue to weave them into one strand. Mm -hmm. There's nothing, I don't regret it, I don't feel, there were things I could have put aside. Mm -hmm. That photograph, if the museum gives it to me today, I will be very grateful, and I feel that they are holding it against me. I don't think they should be the keepers, mm -hmm. but that's me and the museum, and we'll sort that one out. Mm -hmm. But our minds will be as decolonized as we choose to be. Also, um, depending on the systems, processes, curriculum, education, government policy or no policy that we build today. So what will it take to decolonize? The actions of today. This particular activity, this symposium, is a step forward in decolonizing. We've already started, well, started. We have joined the bandwagon of decolonizing. 
and um, it is definitely not entertainment. I don't think this symposium is entertainment. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot yesterday. Mm -hmm. I continue to learn today. And I think we are building bridges and moving forward. Um, Caroline said that there's a disconnect between uh, what was done in the past and what is happening today. That precisely, it's a job of many people, but it's also the job of academia. We need to bridge the gap between what we teach in school, how we live life, and what we aspire to. We need to bring them together. We cannot go to school where we are learning about, you know, the history, the Vigango, it happened, it was um, an artifact comes from a community that lived life. We are looking at specific human lived experience. The Mijikenda of today may not know about the Vigango. So we also need to take them to their own past. This is what your forefathers did with the Vigangos. This is what it meant to them. If we make meaning out of the artifacts, now we are reviving, revitalizing, mm -hmm. giving some meaning mm -hmm. to those cultural artifacts because we are honoring the people who came before us and we want to step on their shoulders and continue living life. Mm -hmm. So decolonizing is not just a question of throwing a backward glance. No, we have to take it up and move forward and uh, move on. Um, Garnet's question, could you please repeat it for me? I didn't yes. quite catch it, Garnet. and I wouldn't like to leave it unanswered. Mm -hmm. So just hold on, Garnet. I know you're online. Um, I'm sorry, Chief. If we Eva. locate Dr. Muduma's family photograph within, I uh, thinking think about Dr. Sige's position yesterday on IP. Doesn't this image therefore belong to the colonizer? Remember the question about the Lafa and the Lafi? Yes, yes, I do. In the way your participation today will be archived under the British Council. Secondly, is it problematic that we're still members of the Commonwealth? Mm. I cannot pretend to speak for the nation about belonging to the Commonwealth, <laughs> but I think it is safer to stand in there because like it or not, we have been part of the Commonwealth. To say that we are walking out today, what benefits shall we yes. harvest from that? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but that's for the nation to answer. I cannot answer for the nation. Mm -hmm. My own individual voice, let's stay on in there. Mm -hmm. There may be some things that are not to my taste, to, but 90%, I don't argue with it. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm speaking as Lydia not for the Kenyan nation. Mm. I don't have that competency. Mm. Yes. And uh, I also understand that the photograph of my relatives has been archived under the British Museum. What I am asking is that the British Museum make that photograph accessible to me mm. and that they also uh, refer to me, acknowledge me. By me, I mean me and my family mm. and the rest of the people. They can continue holding it, although I would rather they ferried it back this way and keep the copy. Mm -hmm. What I want is the acknowledgement. What I want is that they bother to identify the people who are related to the rest of the database that they have. Mm -hmm. That acknowledgement is much more important than the physical photograph. Mm -hmm. Garnet, I hope I've answered you. And Thank I, you very much. Thank you very much. Maybe also just thinking about it. Maybe Juma, you can respond very fast to yeah. uh, there. I think you Number noted your issues. The uh, art collection policy, mm -hmm. uh, the issue of uh, the Juba Lamtoana, the Pokomo drum, and the sound, and what we are doing about it, and uh, what else? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll start with Wachuku. What? Wanjugu. 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 Now that's a very unique name. I've never heard Wanjugu before. Uh, the issues to do with policy rest squarely with the ministry. Uh, National Museums of Kenya is an agency under the ministry. And so if there are policies to be formulated, we can only take part in it as invitees. But that policy is squarely a, a, a prerogative of the ministry. Mm -hmm. So we have no roles to play there 
uh, and we, we cannot purport to present minutes. So in terms of timelines of when that policy will be ready now, uh, if Dr. Lagarde was in attendance, mm -hmm. he could have been the best person to, uh, to talk about it. And so I'll pick this up with him and I, I'll get your email address, then we can have a conversation. Uh, Peter, yes, uh, there's one thing I need to make clear here. We are not criminalizing collections. If you heard me when I was talking about this, uh, that database that we are receiving is not a criminal thing. What we are doing is to look at the database with a different lens and pick out objects that left in problematic manner. Collections move around the world all the time. It's the, it's, that's the in thing for museums. We borrow uh, to exhibit, we buy. It's, it's natural. So whatever is being bought today, willing buyer, willing seller, will not be contentious 30 years from now unless your grandchild thinks you signed a very raw deal, uh, but there's nothing they can do about it. Uh, people's culture uh, grows over time. I, I think the art scene will change. As more of us become aware of the value of artwork, contemporary art, people will start buying them. And it's also something that artists need to be realistic about. We don't have a policy. You know, the, you cannot form a, a policy that forces people to buy. But, for example, if the Kenya Revenue Authority will give us as incentive so that if we buy from you, uh, there's a way that my income tax then become less, mm -hmm. there'll be more money at my disposal then to buy artwork. Mm -hmm. But this is something that artists themselves need also to look at their marketing models. Mm -hmm. uh, at times, uh, the artwork is so highly priced mm -hmm. because possibly you target the wrong people. Mm -hmm. But if you make it a mass market, I believe most of us will be willing to have pieces of this. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Muchai, the Pocomo drum is uh, something that is very close to my heart. I remember at the beginning of the International Inventories Program, one of the key things, uh, the first letter that I sent out was to the British Museum. They didn't respond until 12 months later when they responded and said, okay, we are offering you a fellowship. You can come to us and stay for about three months. We have offered you 10,000 pounds, but it, it didn't come with a database. We got in touch with the Pocomo community, and the king has been super patient with the British Museum. But what I can announce here is that through IIP, we kind of forced the two to start talking. So there has been a Zoom meeting between uh, the Pocomo King and the curator in charge of African collection at the British Museum. The King's brother was allowed access to the drum at the British Museum. And they also allowed uh, Al Jazeera to do a coverage of it. So this is something that the national government will have to pick up as it picks up other claims that come from communities. And this is where a comprehensive database of community claims is very important. And it also feeds back to the question about policy, mm -hmm. that if we have a national policy where all these claims can be made and then government picks it up and using our diplomatic means, we can have this back. I know Professor Kimani will talk about this at some point because when you look at Ethiopia, for example, they have had a series of successes with repatriation. And it happens because they have a restitution commission and gov their government is actively involved in the process. And as we all know, the burden of bringing back those objects will rest squarely with us, the Kenyan people. So what happens if it's a government process, uh, Kenya government can order, for example, KQ to handle all the logistics of bringing the objects back. Mm -hmm. But the Kopokomo community might find it very expensive to bring those objects back. So something, it's something that we have picked up. It's part of the dat what is in our database as IIP, which will rest here in the National Museums of Kenya. And we are hoping that Kenya government will pick it up and escalate it to the relevant people. Now, uh, I will first address Caroline that the youths are integral part of this process. Uh, but you see, participation is never forced. Uh, we are now here as part of this conversation now the, the responsibilities are now on your side 
to go and preach, you become a preacher when you go back mm -hmm. so that people become aware of the processes. Mm -hmm. But when you look at Vigango, they, are, they tend to not be youth affair. Vigangos are about the, the elderly. Mm -hmm. So the Pokomo community has a way of transiting. So the youths who are complaining now, when they become elders, mm -hmm. they will have gone through those processes mm -hmm. within their communities and they will understand better what Vigangos are. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Athman Lali, the question of land grabbing is beyond NMK. Uh, at times, the people behind it are so powerful that individual directors cannot tackle them. Uh, what happens if the communities around there feel strongly against this? National Land Commission can be petitioned, and this has happened in Kitale and other places where NMK got back grabbed land. Mm -hmm. So you have raised it. We'll try and address it with the relevant bodies. If there is also legitimate concern on the ground, what will happen is the National Land Commission will pick it up. And there's no one too big for National Land Commission. Mm. They have gotten back things from even some very powerful people, mm. except if they are untouchables. Mm. Thank you. Let's continue having this conversation. And I think at this point, I'm going to ask my two very able and well-articulated panelists to wind it up with a sentence, a load of one sentence, one parting shot. Maybe we can start with uh, Dr. Muthuma. Um, we make culture by living life as who we are. If we are true to ourselves, if we want the best, if we treat everybody else as equally human, I think there's a lot going for us, a lot that is good. Thank you. Yeah, my parting shot is politicians listen to their people. We need, if you are truly and genuinely interested in institution, we need to make noises. This should be in the campaign policies, for example, manifestos of all the presidential candidates for now. And that's the task I've given to Posakimani mm. to look for them, smoke them out, and put restitution mm. in their campaign manifesto so that the next government will, make, will be serious about restitution. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much. Let us applause our, our panelists. Thank you very much.